So welcome to a quick video on uh, what nuclear radiation actually is and how we express that in equations and lastly on half-life. So these are the three types of ionising radiation that you need to know about. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they are, uh, what mass they have, what they can go through, what charge they have and therefore how ionising they are, so how easily do they change what atoms are and how they are affected by electrical fields and magnetic fields, that's deflection there. So an alpha particle is actually a helium nucleus. Okay, uh, let's keep spelling this word wrong, the nucleus. Uh, so it is two protons and two neutrons. Okay, so that's the alpha particle, that's what it would look like. It um, could be written in notation as uh, HE, and then the two, remember that donates two protons, and four, that's its total mass. Or we could write it as the alpha particle, that sort of squiggly A particle, with the same notation, two protons and two neutrons. Its mass, well look from here, its mass is four. Okay, now because of that high mass, it's actually not very penetrating. So what we say is its range is only about two to four centimeters in air. We say that uh, it will be stopped by thin paper or we could say uh, it's stopped by dead skin. So it, largely, if, if it's outside the body, it won't even get in through the dead skin. It's charged, well it's got two protons, so it's charge is a positive charge, and it's two. It's ionizing ability then, if you like, is quite strongly ionizing. because it's got a plus two charge. Okay, so what it will do is it will actually take electrons from atoms uh, with that positive charge. So how is it affected by a electrical field then? If it was to come into an electrical field, it would be attracted towards the negative side, but it wouldn't be very much deflected because it's quite a heavy particle. It therefore is difficult for that electrical field to deflect. And how would it be deflected by a magnetic field? Well, if that's the magnetic field going into the page, so north's above us and south's there, then it would be deflected upwards. Again, though, not very much deflection because of its mass. So what is a beta particle? Well, a beta particle is a high-energy electron learned about electrons before. Okay, so there it is. It's moving with very high energy. Um, we can also give it notation. It's got a minus one charge. Okay, so it's a bit like saying it's, it's the opposite of a proton, but it's got no mass, so it definitely isn't a proton. Or you could write it as an electron, like an E, but with the same number notation. They're going to be useful when we come to do the equations in a little moment. It's mass. A lot of textbooks or people will say, especially in chemistry, will tell you that the electron has no mass, but it does have mass. It has one eighteen hundredth of one relative, relative atomic mass. So it doesn't have very much at all, but there is a little bit of mass there. Um, its penetration, it will travel about two metres in air. We can stop it, uh, stopped by uh, about two millimetres of aluminium. Okay, it will go through your skin though, so uh, we're, we're not kind of safe automatically from it. It's charged, it's charged with an electron, it's minus one. So it's, it, it's not very ionising, it's not as strongly ionising as the alpha particle, it's about half as ionising as you can see as uh, the alpha particle, but I'm going to call it medium because, well, you'll see in a moment when we talk about the gamma. It's deflection. Because it is negative, it will be deflected towards the positive side in an electric field. 
and you can see it's got more of a deflection than the alpha particle and that is because it's got less of a mass. Similarly in a magnetic field it's going to be deflected more than the alpha particle and because of the opposite charge it's going to be deflected in the opposite direction. I'm just going to add little arrows on these so that you know which direction the thing is moving. Okay, so gamma radiation, what is it? Well, it is uh, electromagnetic radiation. It's the highest energy. Electromagnetic radiation is very uh, low wavelength, very high frequency. Okay, so it is actually a wave. If we could see it, it would be like a little high frequency wave. And we can use it in an equation occasionally if we want to give it a notation, it would be zero, zero and the little gamma symbol. It's mass, this one, this time it does have no mass, it's pure energy. Uh, and it's got a very high range, okay, it will travel forever pretty much in air, it will travel a long, long way. It's only going to be stopped by very thick, we're talking, you know, greater than 10 metres of lead is there anything that's going to stop it or or concrete as well and we often use both together to try and shield ourselves from gamma radiation it's charge it's a wave it's electromagnetic wave so it's got no charge it is very therefore weakly ionizing okay uh, so it doesn't do but it, you can ionize things but how it does that is by transferring energy to it as a continuous wave uh, and therefore disrupting the um, atomic structure. In an electric field, okay, it's not got any charge, so well, it's just going to carry straight on, no deflection. And the same thing in a magnetic field, it's just going to carry straight on going because it's got no charge. Okay, you kind of need to be uh, very familiar with those and be able to use those. You do need to remember for these two, you need to remember the notation because they're going to be useful when we come to the equations in a moment. That's something you need to remember for your exams. Uh, so, here's how we express those decays in nuclear equations. Okay, it's a bit like a chemical equation that shows how the nuclear reaction happens. Okay, you can see this one is a large nucleus, and usually large nucleuses they give out alpha radiation. So this is going to be our alpha equations here. This one I've drawn here is uh, radon. It's uh, number eighty-six in the periodic table. Eighty-six protons. Remember. 219 protons plus neutrons. It's going to decay into uh, polonium. Okay, and polonium is number 84, and number and this isotope is going to be 215. So uh, plus what will be given out is an alpha particle, and we've already said alpha particles are two protons and two neutrons. Now notice this equation says that Radon turns into polonium and gives out an alpha particle. This is the important bit to notice. You notice 219 is equal to 215 plus 4. So the total number of nucleons, total protons and neutrons in the equation is balanced. It's equal. Uh, in the bottom line, the total number of protons is also balanced. You can see 86 uh, is 84 plus 2. So in a exam, you could be given something like this. You could be given, told that uranium is going to decay into thorium-234 by alpha decay. Okay? And what you'd need to do is you'd need to remember, you need to fill in the blanks, basically. So you need to remember what the notation for alpha is, uh, two protons two neutrons, so two and four, and then you can just balance out the top line and the bottom line. So you can start with either. Something unknown equals 234 plus four. Well, 234 plus four is 238. So this is uranium, 238. 
92 is something plus 2. Well, that missing something has got to be 92 equals 90 plus 2. Okay, so it's really quite simple, really, when you know how. So this time, this is a smaller isotope here. This is uh, carbon 14. Okay, and smaller isotopes tend to do beta radiation. So carbon 14 decays into nitrogen 14 plus a beta particle. Okay, once more, if you look at the numbers, you can see they balance. So 14 is 14 plus 0. 6 is 7 minus 1. And that's the tricky one. Now what this actually says is that actually you get one more proton in the nucleus during beta decay. But you don't get any more total protons plus neutrons. So what must have happened then is that a neutron has turned into a proton. Okay, it's absolutely fascinating how that works in uh, nuclear decay. Again, you could be given a sort of half-finished equation. This time it's cobalt. You'd be given something like that. You, one thing but not the other. Cobalt decays into nickel uh, and you're told in this case it's nickel um, 60 okay, plus a beta particle. Okay, and you'd need to work out all the blanks. So you need to remember the beta um, annotation, the beta notation, minus one, minus one charge, no mass or no protons or, ne or neutrons. 27 is something minus 1, or 27 is 28 minus 1. Okay. Something is 60 plus 0. Well, 60 is 60 plus 0. Okay, so that, they're the two equations there. There isn't an equation for gamma because uh, gamma normally comes along accompanying one of these other two types of radiation. You need to also be aware that uh, radioactive decay is a random process. Okay, like other random processes like rolling the dice, it has a certain probability of occurring. So if there's a high probability of uh, the decay occurring, then you're going to have a more active substance or more radioactive substance. So that brings us on to the topic of a half-life, and this is how we measure how long a sample of radioactive material will stay active for. So because it's a probability, it's not a, um, it's not a definite, definitely going to happen thing, it's a random process, we end up with a decay curve that looks something like this. Okay, it's not a linear relationship. The activity, the number of active nuclei, doesn't just fall straight down. Okay, as time goes on, it's time on this axis, then the activity falls, but it doesn't fall in a straight line relationship. It falls as a curve. It falls as a non-linear relationship. So what is the half-life then? The half-life is defined as the time it takes for the number of active nuclei in a sample to half. So let's say in this case, it's gone from 1,000 active nuclei at the start to 500. In reality, these numbers are way bigger than this, but just for the sake of easy calculation, we've given you these ones. Um, so the time taken, well, I can take from my half point, 1,000 to 500, across to the line and then down to the time axis. And you can see that the first half-life, the time taken for the active nuclei to, uh, in the sample to half, is 30 seconds. Okay, well, officially it's the average time it's ta it takes because this is a probability equation, it's not always going to be the same. In this case, from 500 to 250, how long did that take? Well, it took 
another 30 seconds. So the second half-life is 30 seconds as well. So the on average is 30 seconds. And you can see that to half again, it takes another 30 seconds and to half again, it takes another 30 seconds. So that's the definition of half-life. Quite a tricky thing to understand, but you need to be able to uh, get a half-life from a graph using the interpolation like that. And you need to be able to use a half-life to do uh, some calculations. So if they had said there are a thousand uh, nuclei in a sample, how many nuclei will it be after 60 seconds? Well, you know it's dropped by half twice, so it's gone from a thousand to 500, and then by half again, so there'd be 250 left. Okay, so that's how we use the idea of the random process. And then lastly, you need to understand that there is radiation all around us um, at all times, and this is called the background radiation. Okay, and there are some reasons for that. Uh, the main ones you'll need to know, there is things called cosmic rays, gamma radiation that just comes at Earth from outer space. And there are also some radioactive materials in Earth. So we say there's radioactive um, radiation coming from rocks all around us. And depending on where you live, that's more or less depending on the rocks that you live on. Uh, there are some gases in the air. Okay, and radon is one of those. Uh, it's radon to noble gas, you may remember it's part of the answer. And uh, there are also some man-made causes. For example, uh, nuclear accidents uh, like Chernobyl or Fukushima, or also nuclear weapons tests, um, which have some radioactive fallout. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I hope that helped.